This is uh, domain made, domain modeling made functional. And um, I thought just to start the morning off, I'll give you a little challenge. And this is a little bit of um, code, a little data type, obviously. And so how many things are wrong with this design? You've probably written code like this many times where you have some sort of contact or a customer type and they've got a name and they've got an email and all this kind of stuff. Um, did you think this is a good design? Is this is how you'd write it? What, what kinds of things would be wrong with it, do you think? <coughs> yeah? N name could be anything. Yeah, you mean so there's no validation on the name, right? Yeah? It's only got one email. <laughs> That's true. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Uh huh. Primitive type using a string rather than something more sophisticated. Right. Exactly. Good. Okay. That's all good. So yeah, I think you guys are in the in the right place because I'll be talking about exactly those things. And what we'll do in the, in the course of this talk is we'll see how to evolve this design into something which is much more self-documenting um, and does actually capture the domain better. <clears throat> so before I talk about the nitty gritty of domain modeling, um, I just want to talk about why, why do domain modeling at all? Because you know, if you think of software development as a, as a process, there's an input and there's an output, um, and there's you know, the middle bit, the coding part, and we spend most of our time talking about coding and tooling and you know, all the fun stuff, the, the, you know, stuff as developers we like to do. But um, the problem is, this is like a regular process, um, garbage in, garbage out, right? So even if you have the best development tools and the best programming language in the world, if you have garbage coming in, you're going to have garbage coming out. You can't, have a, you can't ever have a good uh, product if the input is bad. So the idea of doing domain-driven design, doing proper domain modeling, is if you can reduce the garbage in, then hopefully you can reduce the garbage out. And that's you know, the design process, basically. So we, we, we should spend some more time focusing on design and not just spending time on coding and tools. So that's what this talk is about. How can we reduce the garbage in? All right, so let's go back to this. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you the things that I think are wrong with this, and you'll probably agree with most of them. Um, the first thing is which values are optional, right? It's not at all clear that is the, is the first name required or is it optional? Is the middle initial required or optional and so on? It doesn't, it doesn't tell you from the code. Now, you, you may have some validation logic buried in your code somewhere. It says, yeah, if the, if the middle initial is null, that's an error. Or that's allowed to be null, but the first name's not allowed to be that's in your code, that's not right in your face. What we want to do is actually encode it in the design, not in the actual code buried in some validation uh, module somewhere. <clears throat> so in this case, that one's optional and all the other ones are required, say. Okay, what are the constraints? So as you say, these are we're using primitive types. Can, uh, can you really have a, a first name that's like a million characters long? Can you have a first name that has non-printable characters in it? Uh, maybe you can, but you know, most of us would find that hard. If you're printing out a mailing label or something, you're going to have to l limit it to some standard length and you know, not allow carriage returns or something in your, in your first name. So there has to be some sort of constraint. In this case, it can't be more than 50 characters. Now, I realize that in the real world, people do have names which are longer than that, but we're, unfortunately, in the, in the normal world, we actually have to deal with databases and stuff. So there's normally constraints on what we can do. Um, which fields are linked. So um, <clears throat> in terms of atomically, atomic updates versus independent updates. So if one person is changing the name on one website, I mean, on one browser, and on, on another browser, they're hitting the same thing and they're changing email. Is that okay? Is there a concurrency problem? Probably not. But if one person's changing the first name and the other person's changing the last name, then we probably do have some sort of concurrency problem, right? But it's not clear from this design. So what we want to do is group them um, into things which have to be updated atomically. So that's an atomic update and that's another atomic update. Okay, and then what's the domain logic? So we have this uh, is email verified flag here 
And we use that to say, okay, you know, I've sent you, a, uh, you've put in your email, but I don't know that you own it yet, so I'm going to send you a, a, you know, a, a verification email, and you have to click on the link and verify who you are. And if you have verified who you are, uh, you can set this Boolean flag. The problem is, that I just said all this, but that's not anywhere indicated in the, in the design, right? Nowhere is that. It's like, again, there's some piece of code that does this, but it, the design doesn't make this at all obvious. Uh, and it's quite easy for someone to set it to false or true without any, without accidentally or deliberately, malicious, either maliciously or accidentally, they can set it to the wrong thing. So the rule is, in this case, the rule is, if you put in a new email address, you have to reset this to false because you haven't verified it. There's nothing in the design that, that conveys that information. So these four things, um, we'll see how we can actually get, encode that in the type system. So F sharp can actually help with all these questions, and most functional languages can too, but I'm going to talk about F sharp today. So uh, domain modeling made functional with the F sharp type system. Um, I'm Scott Voloshin. Uh, I have a website, F sharp for fun and profit .com, so if you're interested in F sharp, do come to my website. Um, so this is a kind of a mishmash of different topics in this talk. So domain driven design, uh, for those who, of you who are not familiar with it, uh, it was originally a book by Eric Evans. But the point about domain-driven design as opposed to object-oriented design or database-driven design or any other kind of driven design, uh, it's about the domain. It's about understanding the, the, uh, the system from a, from a user's point of view, not from a sort of technical point of view. So focus on the logic, the business logic, rather than the technology you're using. So this, is, this talk is sort of the intersection Domain modeling, which is typically considered a sort of OO thing, and functional programming. And I actually think they go together really well, um, and I hope you agree. So I'll talk, first of all, I always put in a bit of thing about demystifying functional programming because I just want to do that anyway for fun. Uh, I'll talk about why it's good for real world applications, then I'll go into the F sharp type system and how it's different from a kind of object oriented type system. Uh, and then we'll get into the meat of the thing, which is how would you design, how would you model that simple thing using types alone? So a lot of people think functional programming is really hard. Uh, they think it's scary because there's all these big words like functor and catamorphism and you know, monoid and monad and all stuff. <coughs> um, those do sound like scary words. And I mean, there's Homer. He's a little freaked out by all these words. Um, the problem with this is that sort of the mathematicians got there first, and these, are, these words are scary, but they're actually not that scary, they're actually just unfamiliar. Um, if you know what they, if you knew, once you know what they are, they're not that bad, and also if you had different names to them, so mappable instead of um, functo and collapsible and aggregatable and chainable or something. Those things, if they were called those things, you still wouldn't know what they were, but they wouldn't be so scary sounding. I mean, like, here's Homer. Right, he's still, he's puzzled, you know, but it's like, it's not so intimidating. So unfortunately, you have to get over the, the mathematical jargon and uh, the concepts are actually pretty straightforward. I'll tell you what's really scary is object-oriented programming. Because there's all these buzzwords, all these strange words like, you know, polymorphism and inheritance and covariance and, and solid, which in turn is another five abbreviations, right? There's a lot of, there's a lot of weird stuff in object-oriented programming, but you're just used to it. So you don't think it's scary. But I think if you're a brand new programmer, this is just the scariest functional program. And of course, there's IOC and DI and ABC and MBC. There's like so many little jargony buzzwords and no uh, All right, so don't forget that just because you know something, you know, you, you have a lot of knowledge normally that you're bringing to a system. Um, the good thing about this talk is you're not going to need any of this stuff. I'm not going to talk about monads or monoids or anything. So it's absolutely from scratch, and it turns out for domain modeling, this is all, you can forget about all this stuff, it's not relevant. All right, functional world, uh, functional programming for real world applications. So people think that functional programming is all about mathematical stuff, or it's kind of algorithms and uh, parallel processing and all this stuff. Um, you know, and it's great for all this stuff, but you need like a PhD to understand it and everything. It's like, well, yeah, it's true. I mean, it is good for all these things. Um, but it's not true that you need a PhD. It, it really, you can, I have a friend who's got an eight-year-old son and he's teaching his, his son F-sharp and it's really, it's so not a problem. 
So I'll tell you what I think functional programming is really good for. Um, what I call boring line of business applications, okay? Which is the stuff that most of us actually do for our day job. This is like writing accounting systems or inventory management systems or e-commerce sites or, you know, boring stuff, basically. The stuff, the stuff that pays the rent. And <clears throat> I think functional programming is actually really good for that. Uh, by the way, I call these things blobbers. So if you like blobber-driven development. Um, so if you think about blobber development, like boring enterprise apps, um, the requirements are you've got to express the, you've got to, uh, express the requirements clearly because you, often you're dealing with people who have a hard time having clear thoughts, the, the, the users. Um, you need a rapid development cycle because you want to kind of get the stuff out the door before they change their mind about what the requirements are. Um, you need high quality deliverables because there's nothing worse than going back and fixing a bug from six months ago when you've already moved on to an, another project, right? So these are things, these are the things you want, and these are the things you want any kind of software, but especially in sort of enterprise software. So um, the nice thing about F-Sharp is it's very concise. It's really easy to express requirements. Again, that's what we're going to be focusing on today. Um, rapid development cycle, um, F-Sharp has a REPL, an interactive um, system where you can actually type stuff that's so very cool for doing rapid development and the high quality. So again, we'll talk about using the type system to, in, to sort of do compile time unit tests. So you can actually write less unit tests and actually have more reliable code. And of course, fun. If you're going to be doing boring, um, if you're building boring applications, at least you have fun doing it, right? So fun is an important aspect of any kind of programming and, and luckily fun is a keyword in F -sharp. So they obviously knew what they were doing. Okay, so F-sharp, blobber development, go together very well. Right, domain-driven design is the next thing. Um, the key point about domain-driven design is it's really about communication. It's not like a, a technique or it's not like a set of buzzwords. To me, it's all about how do you communicate between the developer and the user or the domain expert. So. The, the approach of domain driven design is that you have a shared mental model. So you don't have one of those things where you know, a, a domain expert tells a business analyst and the business analyst tells the software designer and the software designer writes up a requirements document they hand it off to a developer who, write, you know, that whole thing, the whole waterfall, even the agile model, you tend to have this translation stage where the developer translates the requirements into code. In the domain driven design ap approach, the developer and the domain expert and the code itself also all, all have the said Shane, um, domain, uh, same model, the same mental model. So that means that your code looks like the domain. So you don't have things in your code which are not part of the domain. So you don't have any manager classes or factory classes or you know things that, that you know a base, an abstract base class is not part of the domain. A domain expert doesn't know what you're talking about. So you try and avoid that kind of stuff, and, and everything in your code is named in such a way that a domain expert could read it and understand it. That's the theory. Now, unfortunately, it's pretty hard for most domain experts to read most code, but I think we'll see that you, it, we can actually get halfway there. So one of the problems with having a shared mental model is it's really easy to have communication mistakes. And so one of the goals of domain driven design is to try and eliminate these kinds of communi uh, communication mistakes that are quite common. So for example, if I say this word, right, uh, U-N-I-O-N-I-Z-E. So is that someone who's you know, fighting for better pay or is that uh, unionized, right, a chemical, a chemistry, chemistry term, right? Which one is it? Well, the answer is it's both, right? It depends on the context. So this is the, uh, the first thing that domain-driven design talks about, is there's, there's context for things. When a piece of, um, you know, a name doesn't necessarily mean the same thing everywhere. So obviously, in this case, it's really obvious. Um, but we create these contexts for where the words mean something. Um, but here's another one, spam, right? In a supermarket, it means one kind of thing, and in an email system, it means another kind of thing, same word. Okay, well, that's really obvious, but what about product? There's, there's an example where in, in a sales context, it might mean something that you can sell, but in a, in a warehouse system, it might be something that you have in stock. It's a physical item, and, and, and non-physical items don't count. You know. 
So subtly, subtly different meanings there. And if you try and make the same word mean the same thing throughout the entire system, you're going to get in trouble. Um, here's another one, customer. I run into this one all the time where the marketing people think customer is anyone with an email address, anyone they can send, you know, they can spam with emails. And, and the finance people think uh, customer is someone who owes us money. And obviously, coming from a different place, and I've seen people try to merge these into one giant customer which has thousands of different fields and stuff. It's like, that's not going to work. Keep them separate. Um, and then after you get, these, you get these different contexts, within that context, there's a set of words that sort of define the domain. So in the chemistry domain, you have you know, polymer and compound and molecule and stuff. And it's very important as developers that we use these words. So if you're, if you're working on a, a system that does you know, chemical analysis, you don't have a linked list of molecules. You call it a polymer. That's what the domain experts call it. You don't like say, well, technically, it's this kind of thing. It's, like, don't, it's not what it is technically. It's what the domain expert thinks about it. Right? And that set of terms, the terminology in that context is the ubiquitous language. We call that an, an everywhere language. Everybody should use the same words. That includes the code and the developers and the domain experts. And if people are using slightly different sets of languages, that's where you get your communication problems. So similarly in sales, like here's the word product and customer and stuff, warehouse might have something different. So again, the same words, but the, the, the overall set of the, the vocabulary they use might be subtly different. All right, so that's the theory. So let's see how you do that in code, all right? It's, it's like, oh yeah, it's a nice ideal, but surely code is more complicated than that. So let's see. So this is a piece of F-sharp code. And the question is, can you tell what the bounded context is? And can you tell what the ubiquitous language is? Right? So the context means that something like uh, you know, a deck in this context is different from a deck. If you're in a kind of boat building context, deck means something completely different, right? So there's the context, it's the context of a card game, and these are all the nouns and the verbs. Right, so this is an example of how you can represent uh, a ubiquitous language and a bounded context in one page of f -sharp code. And I'll just quickly explain some of these terms. That vertical bar means a choice. So a suit is a club or a diamond or a spade or whatever. That little star means a pair. So a card is a pair of a suit and a rank. Um, the list type is built in. A hand is a list of cards. A deck is a list of cards. And then, um, that's the F-sharp way of doing a function with an arrow. X arrow Y is a function which has X as an input and Y as an output. So for example, the deal to deal is you start with a deck as the input. And after you finish dealing, the, new, the output is a new deck because the deck has got one less card. And there's now a card on the table. So the output is a, is a pair. So we've communicated a lot of the meaning uh, of, the, of the domain in a, in a few lines of code. It's kind of cool. So do you think this is a reasonable amount of code to write, to represent a domain? I think it's not bad. I think um, it would be hard to write this in text to convey the same information. It's quite condensed. Um, do you think a non-programmer could understand this? Yes. Yeah. yeah, you could? Yeah. I think, I mean, you know, you don't have to be, you don't have to go to super detail, but I think it's pretty reasonable. It's certainly good enough that if I was like missing out a suit, if I'd left off hearts or something, they could say, you know, you, you're missing a suit or you're missing how to deal a card. I mean, you, you certainly could go through it and have them understand it. It can act as a sort of shared documentation. And the other thing about this, which is really important, is this what the domain-driven design people call persistence ignorance, which means there's nothing about databases, right? There's nothing about uh, foreign keys and, and, you know, it's like it's purely a domain. There's nothing about classes here. There's nothing about inheritance. There's no abstract thing. There's no interfaces, right? This is all about domain. Every single thing in this is something relevant to the domain. So this is the, you know, there's something we've always been, we always kind of strive to do, especially in Agile, is the design is the code. The code is the design. You try not to uh, have the design be a separate thing. Because if you have documentation or something, it's going to go out of date, right? The code is always the sort of source of truth. So if you can make the design and the code be the same thing, um, 
that's really great. And I think this is really a good way of doing it. So this is not pseudocode, this is executable code. And typically in an F-sharp project, you would do something like this and you'd stick it as the first file in your project. And then obviously you have more complicated code to kind of execute the algorithm. So how do you actually deal, how do you actually do a, you know, a shuffle algorithm, whatever. But this part is something which can be shared between you and the domain expert. So you don't need any UML diagrams, right? You don't need any um, out-of-date documentation, 200-page requirement documents. I think this is a great way. It's a very agile way of w working in, in conjunction with the domain expert. Right, understanding the F-sharp type system. So the F-sharp type system has something called an algebraic type system. Uh, as, do, as does Haskell and OCaml and most function languages. Uh, that's another mathy word, so I'm going to use the word composable type system instead. And composable is like Lego. You can glue pieces of Lego together to make another piece of Lego and so on. So that's what composable means. So let's actually see how that works. So you, given you've got two, two types, you can combine them to make another type, composable. Uh, and there's two ways uh, you can combine them. You can multiply them and you can add them. And that sounds kind of strange. How can you add a type or multiply a type? So let's see what I'm talking about here. Let's say that uh, you have a function. Call it add one. Uh, the input is a set of integers. Any possible integer is an input, and any possible integer is an output. It's easy enough. So we write that in F sharp. We write that as int arrow int. Right? Int is the input, and int is the output. Fair enough. OK, now what happens if the input is a pair? Okay, so we know what the, we can know what the output type is. We can say the output is an int, but what's the input? Now we can say, well, let's just define a class called a pair or something. It's like, no, we have to use it by building on the types we've already got. We can't define a new thing. So what do, how do we how do we do that? Well, if you think about it, a pair is one from the first pile and one from the second pile, right? Every possible combination. So let's say there are four integers in the universe. Uh, how many possible combinations are there? Well, there's you know, four possible things for the first number and four possible things for the second number. Total number of combinations is 16, yes. So it's multiplication, right? Yeah. So we actually write this, and here's, let's, let's say, a pair of Booleans. Two possible ones for the first pile, two possible ones for the second pile. It's four possible combinations altogether. So this is what we call a product type and multiplying two types together, okay? And so uh, in, in f sharp, you actually write it with a multiplication, a star. So int star int is a pair of ints, and bool star bool is a pair of booleans. Right, okay, let's, so okay, that kind of sounds theoretical, but let's look at a, a practical example. Let's say you want to pe model people's birthdays. So Alice has a birthday on January 12th, and Bob has a birthday on February 2nd, or whatever. Well. You take the set of people in the world, all the possible people, and you take all the possible dates, and you multiply them. You get every possible combination of a person and a date, and that is the set of all possible birthdays. So you could quite easily say, okay, a birthday is, is the person times a date, or a, a pair of a person and a date. So that's how you do that. All right, let's look at another example. Let's say that you have a function that figures out whether you have a fever or not. So there's some sort of temperature that comes as the input, and it spits out true or false. So the output's a Boolean, but what's the input? Well, let's say that you want to be good and, and support uh, both kinds of temperatures, Fahrenheit and, and centigrade. Um, what type? How would, we, how would we call that type? Well, if we think about it, again, let's say there's only four possible temperatures. <laughs> um, if you think about it, you can either have one from the Fahrenheit pile or one from the Celsius pile. Right, so how many possible choices are there? There's eight, right? There's four plus four. So we call that a plus. So we call this a sum type. And how can we represent this in F-sharp? Well, they might both be integers or floats or something. So we need to separate them. We need to distinguish them, tag them. And we're going to tag the Fahrenheit ones with an F and Celsius ones with a C and we end up with something that looks like this. So we say a temperature type is either a Fahrenheit, where it's represented by an int, or a Celsius, where it's represented by a float. And this is something that you can't do in C-sharp. 
so the, the pairs and stuff you can certainly do in, in most languages, but this kind of choice type or, or, or combination type like this, this is a, it's really cool, really important for domain modeling. All right, here's a, here's a more real-world example. Okay, we have a payment method. Like what can we do for payment methods? Well, you can take cash, we can take checks, or we can take <coughs> credit cards. Uh, and if you take a check, then you have a check number. And this is kind of getting old, out of date. I'd probably put in PayPal or Bitcoin or something now. But um, you know, what's cool about this is you can have extra information associated with each thing. So with your cash, there's no extra information. Um, but if you pay by credit card, you need to know what the credit card type was and what the credit card number was and so on. So the little bits of information can go along with each uh, choice here. All right. So this is really nice. So this is a, a, a real-world example of, of why these choice types are really useful. Because again, I've got in like four lines of code, I've conveyed quite a lot of information about how payment methods work. And what's cool is then when you actually t need to work with these things, you have to do you have to get the data out, and you get the data out using uh, what we call pattern matching. And it's basically a pattern matching. It's sort of like a switch statement, um, and for each choice, you have a little uh, handler, uh, and what's cool though is that the, as, as part of matching that choice, uh, it extracts the data in that choice too. So you don't have to say, well, if it's, a, if it's a check, cast it into a check and then see what the check number is. It's like, no, you get everything in one go. You, you find out it's a check and you get the check number all in one step. So that's very cool. All right. So one of the nice things about this compared with I mean, if you're going to model this in C sharp, um, you might model this using inheritance, say. You might have a base payment method or an I payment method. Uh, and then you'd have like three subclasses for each choice, say. Um, one of the nice things about this approach is that all the choices are in the same place. Um, there's like three lines of code. If you, if you have a kind of a subclass model in C sharp, you'd actually have like four files. So I'd have to go to lots of different places to try and find out what the all different payments method payment methods were. Here it's like right in your face, very convenient. And the other important thing is there's a closed set of options, which means that um, I can't add if you know I can't inherit from this and add a new a new option automatically. I have to like change this definition. Uh, and you might, you might say, well, that's a bad thing because if, if if I change it, I break all my code. It's like yes, I think that is a good thing because if you add PayPal. That is a you know that's a changing of the domain. Of often, adding a new kind of thing is a new kind of business logic, and it needs to be handled. You don't want to accidentally forget about it and just uh, just inherit from it and then not have everything else work. So, all right. So we normally think in in most kinds of programmers, we think of types as sort of an annotation. Um, you know, say it's just for type checking to make sure our code compiles. Uh, you know, when we say add one and it takes an integer. It's like, okay, if I pass a string to it, the compiler's gonna complain. So we normally think of types uh, and, and as, a, as, a, as, as just for compiler, just to make the compiler happy. Um, but in the functional world, we can think of types also as a domain modeling tool. So here we have a, a, the to deal, okay? So I'm, I'm modeling how to deal something, and I'm not really caring about, it's nothing to do with making the compiler happy about compiling things, it's actually trying to model stuff using types. But the nice thing is you get both at the same time. You get the modeling thing and you get the type checking thing. And as a result, you get what I call compile time type checking. So if, you, if your code does not match the model, you get a compiler error. So if I'm trying to deal and I'm not passing in a deck or I don't spit out the right thing, my code won't compile because it won't type check. So this is what I call uh, you know, kind of like having compile time unit tests. You guarantee that your code matches the model. All right, so typing all the things, uh, functional people love to type everything. All right, so let's see what we can do with this type system. Let's take it out for a spin. Let's start with the optional values that we talked about at the very beginning. How can we model an optional value? So in this case, the middle initial is optional and the other ones are required. Um, let's see, well, let's say Let's talk, start with a simple example. Let's say we have a, a, a string um, and we're calculating its length, right? Now, one of the problems with most programming languages is that null is a valid string, right? So you might say, yeah, fine, if we, if we have an optional string, 
Uh, we'll just model it using a null. Well, there's a couple of problems with that. First of all, you can't tell from looking at the design whether it's optional or not, because null is a valid value for string. And this null is real, really painful, because if you think about it, you know, null doesn't mean anything. You can't say set phases to null. Um, that just, you know, null, it just gets in the way. It doesn't mean anything from a, from a, in the real world. It's just an artifact of programming. And much more, more, more importantly, a null is sort of a, um, a dangerous thing because it's not really a string. From a coding point of view, you know, you, you say, well, here's a function that calculates the length of a string, uh, and you give me a null, and, and the compiler says, yeah, nulls, nulls a string, that's fine, no problem. And when you actually try and ask the null for the length, it's like, ha ha, I'm gonna crash now. And, you know, null reference exception. I'm not really a string, I'm just pretending to be a string, and your compiler won't even detect that I'm not really a string. Right. So nulls are not very good for um, doing optional values. And in fact, I like to say that null is the salmon of static typing. It's like somebody who acts like your friend and then is going to stab you in the back. So null, don't use null. Okay. So if we don't use null, okay. So let's not say let's say that null is not allowed. Okay. We don't want null to be used as any of our types. We want to get rid of it from the from the list of possible values. So if we can't use null, what can we do? Well, what we want to do is model it using what we did before. We say, well, here's a list of possible strings, or nothing. We're missing a string, right? So we're going to model it like this. It's, it's either this thing or it's this thing. Now, we saw how to do that before. This thing or this thing, right? It's going to be a choice type, right, an addition. So we're going to tag the top one with some string. We're going to tag the bottom with nothing. And we end up with a type that looks like this. An optional string is either some string or it's nothing. Now, this is really good because it's now a special type called optional string, and it's really obvious what it is right, in our code. Now, you say, this is awesome. really love this. I'm going to do an optional string. I'm going to do an optional int. I'm going to do an optional boolean. And then, OK, I think there's a little bit of uh, duplication going on here. So let's make a generic type. OK, replace all these with one single thing called an option of t. So the little tick t is F sharp's way of doing generics. And in C sharp, you just have a t. But basically, it says it's either something or it's nothing. This is a really, really useful type, and you use it in F-sharp all the time. So if we go back to our personal name, we say, well, the middle initial is now an option of a string. OK, now it's much more, much more self-documenting now, much clearer. And one cool thing in F-sharp is you can actually uh, take a generic type and stick it at the end. So you can say string option, which is a little easier to read, I think, for a non-technical person. So now we've made it very clear that the, the, this is an optional string and the other ones are required. So basically, it's not optional, it's required. But that's we always say that. And that's pretty readable, I think. All right. Next one, single choice types. So this is something you'll see a lot of in functional domain modeling, is you have you know, a choice of one thing. It's choice of A of A. An email is an email of a string, a choice of email, or a custom ID is a custom ID of int. One choice. Why would you bother to do that? Because it's not, you're not really getting a choice thing. Uh, the reason is because an email address is not just a string, right? An email address has some validation rules about it. I mean, it just might be represented by a string, but it's not really a string. From a domain modeling point of view, an email address is a special kind of thing. Right, the user, the domain expert, doesn't think about strings. They think about email addresses. Um, a customer ID is not an integer. Right? It may be represented by an integer, but you can't add two customer IDs together. Uh, you can't multiply. You can't take the square root of a customer ID. You know, it's not an integer. Um, so what we do is we use these single choice types or these wrapper types to keep these things distinct. So we might say, OK, an email address wraps a string, a phone number wraps a string. But now we've got two separate types, and an email address and a phone number can't be mixed up. They're conceptually different, they're completely logically different things. Now, you can totally do this in, in C sharp. Um, what's really nice about F sharp is you can do it in one line of code. That makes life a lot easier. So you tend to do it a lot more uh, in, a, in a language like F sharp because it's so concise. So what's really nice is then you, when you pass these around, when you say you've got a function that says it takes an email address as a parameter, or it takes a phone number as a parameter, it's really, really obvious what it is. So this is good practice in object-oriented design too. But like I say, it's kind of painful often to write thousands and thousands of classes 
uh, in F Sharp, you might have you know 50 of these, and it's all fit in, in one file. Here's another example: custom ID and auto ID are different things. You don't want to get them mixed up. Right. Okay. So let's look at how we actually create an email address. So we're going to have some horrible regex uh, that makes an email address valid. Um, and if the string that you pass in matches that regex, then we're going to say, yes, we've got a, a, an email address successfully. But what happens if um, it doesn't match the regex? What are you going to do? You're going to turn null? No. You're going to throw an exception? No. We need to indicate some way that this thing might not work. Right? So th the answer is we're going to say, OK, if it's valid, we're going to return something. If it's not valid, we're going to turn nothing. All right? So we're going to use this option type we just defined. And what's cool is if you look at the signature of this function, rather than saying, you give me a string and I give you back an email address, which is a lie, because sometimes it won't, it says, actually, you give me a string and I might give you back an email address, depending on whether you, the email is valid. And this is what's, so this is the, an idea, again, we're getting documentation in the type signature. I don't have to see if there's an exception. I don't have to you know, look at the documentation. I can actually see from the type signature itself that this might not work. So I know I have to handle it, which is great. One of the cool things about this is in F Sharp, everything's immutable. So once I've created this email address, I never, ever have to validate it ever again. I can pass it around to my code, uh, and I can guarantee that no one's going to mutate it and, and mess with it. So you typically only have to do validation at the very beginning of the program. Here's another one, string 50. So to create a string 50, I'm going to pass in a string. And if it's less than 50, that's good. And obviously, I might check for you know, um, non-printable characters and so on. And if it's not, there's none. Okay. And again, if I look at the signature, it says, you give me a string, and I might give you back a string 50, depending on whether it's valid or not. Here's another one. This is something I once saw on an e-commerce site. I could put 999,000 items in my basket. Now, I very much doubt that's what they intended to do. Um, I think that was a bug. Um, and the reason it was a bug is because they were using an integer as their, as their quantity, right? So don't do that. Typically, I mean, in places I work, in e-commerce e site, you can only order like 100 items max. If you're ordering 999,000, you know, you're either doing something malicious or it's like, you know, that's not, that's not really what you should be doing. So the way to solve that problem is to create a new type, as always. Uh, and um, you know, it's easy in F Sharp. You should really be doing this in, in all program managers, but it's, you, you, most people don't bother. It's, like, it's a lot of work to create a new type like this. So you don't bother. But we're going to wrap it in a, in a type. And then we're going to have some code. You know, If it's more than 0, less than 99, it's OK. What's cool about this is if it's 0, it, it's, not, it's not valid. So if you say if you have a, a decrement thing and you hit the minus button, you're going to have to handle the case where it goes to zero. You can't. Your code will be forced to handle that case. You can't say, "I'm not going to handle it," because you literally will not have an order line come back. You'll get nothing back, and so you'll have to handle that case nicely. <coughs> so again, the signature is very self-documenting. All right. So let's go back to our challenge. Um, first name, middle initial, last name. OK, so we've now got the middle initial is optional. That's good. We've now got these uh, constrained types, which are much more clearly documenting of what they do. Um, and we can also break it up into smaller pieces really easily. So we now say a contact is a name and an email. Uh, and the name has these things, and the email has these things. Great, OK. So that's three out of the four. Um, but let's talk about this email verified. So let's zoom in on that. So we've got some business rules. If the email has been changed, you need to set the flag back to false. And you can only set it to be true by special verification service. So like this logic about verifying it, there's going to be some sort of hash that's checked against the email, and I'll make sure it's good. I don't want anyone setting this to be true. I want only this piece of code to do it. So how can I, how can I enforce that in the design? Right? And how can I make it clear that you can't do that? All right, and again, anyone can say the truth. That could be done for malicious reasons, or it could be done accidentally. You could cause a bug where you're sending passwords to people who haven't even verified the email, and so on. Not good. So, what we're going to do is create a new type. And of course, in domain modeling, you always create a new type. 
it's always the solution to everything. Um, there's no problem that can't be solved by wrapping it in another type. So we've got our email address already. We're now going to wrap it in another type called a verified email address. Okay. Now, what do we do with that? We have our verification service, and it's going to take an email address as input, and it's also going to take some sort of hash, and it's going to spit out a verified email type, maybe. Right? You give me an email address, I might give you back a verified email, assuming that the hash matches and you're not trying to fool me. Now, what we can do is make this verified email type have a private constructor. So the, the only person who can create it is this verification service. Right. So it's, it's the type is public, but the, the constructor is private. So that means that as, the, as anyone else, it, it, any other part of the system, I can't create my own verified emails. I have to go through the verification service. It's the only way I can get a verified email. Okay. So next, is, okay. So this and it's very clear that you might it might not be verified. So you're going to have to handle that case. Now, now we do is we go back to our original design, get rid of the Boolean flag, and we say that email is either a verified email or an unverified email. If it's an unverified email, it's just a regular email address. And if it's a verified email, it's one of these special verified email address types. Now, what's cool about this is, first of all, it's much more self-documenting, because it's much clearer than having the Boolean. But the other thing is I literally cannot do the wrong thing. If I, if I change the email address, you give me a new email address, I can, I can get an email address type, that's fine. But then I can only set it to unverified, because I can't, I can't create a verified email. I can only create normal emails. So if, I've given, if you give me a new email address, I have to create an unver the unverified case. I literally cannot do the wrong thing. So there is not only is it self-documented, but it's also guaranteed that I, I conform to this business rule without having to write a unit test. That's very nice. So if we look at the challenge, this is what we've got now. We've got email address, verified email, email content info, personal name, so on and so forth. Which values are optional? Uh, which are the constraints? What are the, what are the link fields and so on? Which values are optional? It's very clear now from the design. What are the constraints? Uh, that's very clear now from the design. Um, which fields are linked? It's very clear now from the design. Uh, the domain logic is much clearer now. We have a concept of an unverified and a verified email. So the design is better. And also, this, this thing of ubiquitous language. Initially, we had one thing called a contact, and we were using primitive types. Right? Now we have like six, seven different things, but they represent the domain much better. I mean, we, we now have a concept of a verified email address. It's now represented by something in our code. And we have represented as a choice between these two things. And so this is good, because this is how the domain expert would say, yeah, we, we, we do these kinds of things with verified emails. We do password resets with them or something. It's actually a lot, this is actually a lot better from the domain modeling point of view. So it's, the code is more useful, and it's more self-documenting. And of course, this is compilable code. Right? This is not a documentation. This is code. All right, so final thing, making illegal states unrepresentable. It's a cool. Uh, phrase. <coughs> um, let's say that sometime later they decide to have uh, an address as well as an email. Okay, fair enough. But they have a new business rule. Okay, you have to have a, a contact must have uh, either a, an email address or a postal address where you can contact people. Fair enough. So the question is, does this design meet that business rule? The answer is no, it doesn't, because remember, everything is required. So these two uh, properties are both required right now. So as, as it stands, you have to have both. OK, well, let's not do that. Let's make them optional. So does this meet the requirements? No, it doesn't, because in this requirement, they could both be missing, right? Now, what you could say was, OK, I'll have them both be optional, and I'll put in some um, special code somewhere that validates if one isn't missing and the other one's missing. That's an error answer. No. That's in the code. Like, I want to do it in the design. How can I capture it in the design where you literally cannot screw it up? OK. So if you think about it, so this is this guideline. Make illegal states unrepresentable. So rather than saying, yeah, they can both be missing, and I'll put some special code in to validate it, you're asking for trouble. Like, if you can actually encapsulate this business rule in the, in the design, you literally can never have that thing happen. And you never have to write a unit test for it. And you never have to write any special validation code for it. It literally cannot 
exist. So how can we, how can we solve that? Well, if you think about it, when you say you must have an email address or a postal address, there's actually um, three choices. It's either got an, only an email address, or it's got only a postal address, or it's got both. Right, there's three choices. Right, how can we model three choices in our code? Well, we say it's either an email, or it's an address only, or it's both. Right. So we just model our three choices right there. Right, and there's no fourth choice. There's no choice where they're both not missing. Where they're both missing. Right. So this is an example of literally modeling it in such a way that I have to be one of these three things. The fourth one where they're both missing is not an available option. So this is very cool. And we stick that back in our main thing, and now we have a, you know. So this is an example of encoding the requirements in the type. So and I say, this has multiple benefits. I can't um, do the wrong thing, but more, more importantly, it's actually self-documenting code. One of the problems with having sort of your validation logic buried in some file somewhere is it's not clear to me as, a, as another developer, if I'm, if I'm inheriting your code base, or I'm working on your code base, it's quite easy for me to accidentally forget to call that validation logic. You know, um, This is self-documenting. It's like, if I have this thing, I look at it, it's like, oh, okay, these are the, literally the only three things I can do. So it, it actually it helps to document the code as well as to constrain it. Now, so there's what we had before. We had an email address, two separate things, and afterwards we now have this new contact, which has a field, and that field has this choice. So now we have, again, we have a new a domain concept called contact information. And that didn't exist before. We've learned something new about the domain. So this is awesome. Um, static types are almost as awesome as a cat on a unicorn. Um, not quite, but it, it's pretty cool what you can do with static types. You, obviously, you can't do everything, um, but for the stuff you can do, it's, it's really nice. It saves you a lot of time. Um, let's just look at one more variant on this. Let's say that they change their mind, and it's like they say, well, actually, we don't really care that they have to have one or the other. We just want at least one way of contacting somebody. All right? That's much po probably a better way of doing it. We just have at least, we want to have at least one way of contacting you. So what we're going to do is say, OK, here's the ways we can contact you. We can contact you by email. We can contact you by address. We can contact you by phone, whatever. That's the way of being contacted. And then in our contact, we say, OK, there's primary contact information and secondary contact information. Primary contact information is required. And the secondary contact information is optional. Or it could be a list if you want to have more than one. And again, we've now documented uh, what the constraints are. You literally, you have to have a primary contact info. But the contact info could be email or, or personal list. We're not, we're not constraining that. All right, so let's look at what we covered. We've got the, the original challenge, the whole thing of ubiquitous language, and the self-documented design. I think we've seen that pretty good. Um, algebraic type, so there's that kind of mathy buzzword. But hopefully, you see, it's not... Uh, Forget about the, ma the, the, the mathematical stuff. Just like you can see, the, the concepts are really pretty straightforward. Um, but using choices rather than inheritance is a really nice thing. You see that we used it over and over for modeling things, doing choices. It's really, really, if it's the one thing I really miss in C Sharp is having these choice types. Um, designing with types don't use null, use options. Use these single case unions to wrap things and making illegal states unrepresentable. Um, I haven't had time to cover a lot of stuff, so really just scratching the surface. There's a lot of stuff to do with states, uh, state machines, and state transitions, uh, services, CQRS, all this stuff. Um, can't talk about it right now, but I have other talks on these kinds of topics if you're interested. Um, so there you go. Thanks so much. Main modeling we finished. All the code and the um, slides and, and the videos are on my website at slash ddd. So if you go there and you want to watch this video again, you can go there, and, or if you just want to look at the slides. Um, if you want to know more about F-Sharp, there's an organization, fsharp.org. And if you like this talk, um, I have a book coming out shortly. Uh, it's actually available right now as early access. So you can go and if you just search for Domain Modeling Made Functional Book, it'll probably show up there. It's, it's Pragmatic Press. Um, if you do get it, I'll be very interested to get your feedback. Um, also, in room six, immediately following this, there's 
two more functional programming talks, which look very good. So if you, if you think this is interesting, um, you can learn some more stuff. And I'm also doing an AMA in the session after this in room eight, I think it is. So uh, yeah, thanks very much for coming. And um, yeah, let me know. I, I think we've got time for questions or, yeah, well, I think we've got a few min minutes for questions. Or alternatively, we can just stop and you can come and ask me questions separately. What, what do you think? Does anyone have any urgent questions? Yes. Right, so the question is, how, how do you actually do the, these private constructors? Yeah, yeah. I didn't show it in the code, no. It's a little tricky. Yeah. Um, yeah. Is it, in the book? it is in the book, yeah. <laughs> it's also, on, my, it's also on, the, on the website. As soon as you have private stuff, it does become tricky. Often you can get away with not actually making it private, but just by, it's, it's, if, if you're lazy, um, it's the kind of thing where you, 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 you tend not to do it anyway. It's, it's, as soon as you have a type, you immediately say, okay, I better just call the create method on this thing and not just like do it by hand. But yeah, there are ways, if, you really, if you're writing an API and I really, like an email address might be worth doing because I really don't want people to mess it up. Yeah. yeah, but like phone number, maybe, maybe not, I don't care. It depends how much you care about validation, yeah. Any other questions? No? All right, well, thanks very much, everyone. Cheers.